You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey Vet Rehabbers, today I chat with Lisa Mason from Florida Veterinary Rehabilitation. We chat about the optimum way to communicate with our clients to get their buy-in for our treatment plan options and also how to encourage their compliance, especially with things like home exercise programs. Before we head over to the interview, I just wanted to let you guys know that those of you that are interested in the business side of veterinary rehabilitation, we have an awesome Facebook group. It's called the Business Vet Rehabbers. It's free and open to the whole community. We do Facebook lives there and share tips and advice all about running a successful vet rehab practice. We'll also be hosting a business discussion room at this year's Vet Rehab Summit. This is our online veterinary rehabilitation conference. It's on the 14th of November this year. It includes 21 hours of CPD lectures, around the world networking rooms, virtual exhibitors booths, and also the announcement of the IAVRPT Vet Rehab Therapist of the Year Award. You can find out more at vetrehabsummit.com. So without further ado, over to Lisa. Hey Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Megan, thanks for having me. Lisa, for the listeners that don't know anything about you, won't you tell me about yourself and how you got into the field of vet rehab? Absolutely. I am Lisa Mason, and I am a veterinarian in uh, Florida, in Central Florida, and I own uh, Florida Veterinary Rehabilitation, and we are a standalone rehab facility. We've been open for two years now, or a little more than that. I got into rehab for several reasons, but the biggest reason was I was tired of euthanizing geriatrics because of lack of mobility was a big reason. And then I had my own personal issues where I reached towards integrative medicine, towards chiropractic, acupuncture, rehab to get over my own personal injuries and it works. And, and I see it work every time. And I really love the the close personal communication that I get with the dog uh, or the cat, as well as with their owners. And I think that that's something you can't get in a 15 minute visit. And it's something that we can be very good at in rehab. And uh, it's one of my favorite parts about rehab medicine. So um, for those of you that are online Pet Health members, you will know Lisa because Lisa runs a really successful wet rehab practice. And for that reason, I've actually asked her to come in and do a whole lot of training on the business platform. Um, So thanks, Lisa, for always sharing your knowledge. um, And you always have come up with some amazing, amazing ideas. Um, And today we're going to be chatting about how to communicate and connect with our clients. Um, So I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think this is something that it either comes naturally to you um, or something that you actually learn over time, you know? So I think for some of us, maybe, you know, I I know definitely in the veterinary side of things, I think there's some people that get into veterinary because they don't really want to deal with people and they're thinking they're just going to deal with animals. And then we realize, wow, we actually really need to deal with people, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. You know, I, I've heard that so many times. I, I want to do vet rehab because I don't like people. And then, yeah. you know, it's like, no, a lot of this is explaining what the pet's going through to the person, to their person, you know? And I think that's, you're the bridge, you're the gap between the pet and the owner and, and helping them communicate the problems that they're experiencing. And then we can help them to feel better. And if you can't explain that to the owners, then the owners will not trust you and they won't understand what you're doing or why you're doing it. Um, So I think it's a really important um, thing to have, to be able to talk to people, to be able to chat with them about what's going on with, with their pets. Yeah, and if you think back to yourself, so would you say this is something that came naturally to you or did you need to learn how to do it? I think it came naturally to me, but I didn't expect it. Um, So I actually learned a lot from my father, who is a human surgeon, and I shadowed him when I was a kid all the time. And I remember being in the exam room with him once, and he does his exam, and, you know, surgeons are known for their, you know, horrible bedside manner. My dad was not. And he walks over into the, the side of the corner and he's, he basically looks at this person and he says, so how's your wife doing? What's going on with your wife? And I was like, 
I don't understand. They're here for their surgery consult. And he's like, they're not here for their surgery consult. They're having trouble with things at home and they just need somebody to listen to them. And he took that time to listen to what they needed. And so just in watching him, I started emulating that. And I started, you know, thinking that, you know, people just want you to listen to them. And if you listen to their problems and then you can then speak for what they're needing, then you're going to get to them faster. You're not going to push your ideas onto them because you're listening to them. And so I watched my dad do that. I'm kind of an introvert, so I didn't think I would be that good at talking to people, but it just came so naturally to me in vet school, being in the room with the clients, being able to explain it, not using this big, huge jargon to make myself look like a really smart person that you should trust, I was giving them a reason to trust me. And that was because I was listening to them actively, responding to them, telling them, yes, I hear what your concerns are, and then telling them that we're going to find an answer. I think that is the key. It's not knowing all of the answers. Being a great doctor doesn't mean you know everything. It means that you're listening to them and you're going to try and use your knowledge that you've gained to be able to come up with a good solution. Yeah, I mean, I think that it also, like you say, you're an introvert. I mean, how do you think it is like for those people that are a little bit more shy um, that maybe come across as being a little bit uh, um, unconfident, you know? And um, sometimes I think like if I go to see a specialist or um, not usually specialists don't, they don't come across this way, but let's say I've, got, I've been to a doctor before and a dentist before and um, I could just see they were a little bit nervous and lacked a little bit of confidence. And when I picked that up, I started to feel like, oh my gosh, like, mm-hmm. is it okay if this guy does a crown or something on, on my teeth? Because I, I'm getting this feeling that he's not very confident in himself. Right. Um, so yeah, those people, I mean, how do you suggest that they, because it's so hard, like, especially when you're first, like a new graduate, you know, you, yeah. you lack that confidence. Um, and it's, it's, I find it very difficult now to look back then because I remember feeling that way. And I remember just, yeah, just completely faking it. Like really just just pretending like I've got this. (laughs) The saying that says fake it till you make it, you know, I think it's, you know, I hate to say that you have to do that, but at the beginning you have to, because you you know, you know what you're doing. I mean, you went to school for all these years, you've done all the studying And sometimes you just have to convince yourself, mind over matter, that I do know what I'm doing and I am going to make a difference. And you have to have that little bit of confidence, not to the point where you look cocky though, and that you look like you are, you know, being pompous. And it's, it's that you have confidence in your knowledge. And if you don't really don't know something, then be honest about it. I don't really know the answer to this and I don't know how we're going to fix this, but I'm going to find out. And I think that means a lot too. So just because, you know, if you have confidence in the knowledge that you have, then it's going to bring you into, it's going to take you a long way. It's going to make those confident, it's going to make those clients find that you have that confidence. And so I'm just, I try and be very honest with my clients and they don't want you to pretend. They want you to be honest, you know, and Sometimes it's hard for people, but in, and we talked about this in the business basics webinar is that, you know, learning more gives you and builds your confidence. Yeah. So, you know, maybe listening to a webinar on, you know, maybe you've got a cruciate case coming in tomorrow that night, listen to the cruciate webinar and learn as much as you can. So it's fresh in your mind. You can mm-hmm. speak intelligently about it so that the owner has that Oh, okay. They know what they're talking about. Use examples from what you have historically fixed, you know, say a post-op TPLO comes in not using their leg. Well, you can say, well, you know, I've had a couple of these cases that were, you know, had some problems afterwards and we were able to manage them by doing X, Y, and Z. Now you've told the owners that you have experience doing it. You have a game plan that you're going to approach you didn't have to know all of these, you know, big terms. You didn't have to share that with the owner, but what you were able to do is you were able to give them confidence that you knew a game plan and you knew where to start. And I think that 
is very helpful for a client to hear from us as doctors. We've got a plan. We don't know all the yeah. answers, but we've got a plan. Yeah, I think you're so right. I think they just want to know that, you know, everything that they are putting their trust in you, you have an idea of how you're going to do that, you know? Yes. Um, and it's okay because I think when, when, we, when we lose that confidence and we start to feel that fear, it's because we think exactly like you say, is that we're not going to know an answer to a question. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it's actually very unlikely a pet owner is going to ask you a question that you don't know the answer to. Um, And like you say, you don't necessarily need to give them all the answers. It's okay. Um, And, you know, I I did a a podcast with um, Katie Ford on imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this comes into it a little bit when we're speaking Mm -hmm. and we're consulting, you know, we start to feel like you say, maybe we don't know everything. Maybe, all the, the, the learning that we've done and the training that we've done wasn't enough, but it is enough. It really, really is. And she speaks about specialists and she says, you know, that the specialists often don't know the answers and they feel really bad about it. Um, and that's exactly what we are. We are a specialist yeah. and it's okay not to have an, an answer. Yeah. But like you say, you just have to have a plan. So if you yes. don't have an answer, have a plan as to how you're going to find that whatever they're asking or where, what you're going to do, what is your plan? And then people will feel confident. They'll think, okay, she's got this. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've got a really great case example that I'm working on currently with a dog who has a post-op um, cruciate, horrible infection, lots of pain, lots of problems. I've worked with the referring um, university that, uh, you know, directly with one of the best orthopedic surgeons I'm also calling all throughout the country, talking to anesthesiologists and pain management folks. And the owners just continuously tell me, thank you, thank you, thank you, because it's not because I know the answer. It's not because I'm the one that's going to create the answer. It's because I'm giving them a plan. I'm saying we have an answer at some point. It just isn't here now. And we're going to keep fighting until we have that answer. And so I'm the one that's just coordinating everything. And the owners really trust me because of that. Um, But I don't have the answers. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not an anesthesiologist. I can't be all of those and wear all those hats. That's where we can get on the phone and communicate with these other specialists. And they're more than willing to. It's, that's an, another thing that I've actually seen throughout this case is how willing other people are to help you. So if you don't have the answer, like get on the phone and start calling people. Like there's so many awesome mentors out there that can totally say, uh, yeah, we absolutely can help guide you in the right direction. I also have in my brain, every case I see, I need to look at them systematically. There are at times cases that may come in that overwhelm me. And I'm like, there's so much going on. What do I do? And I go back to the basics. I go back to my physical exam. I go joint by joint. Then I lay out my problems list and I look at it and I say, what's the most important thing we need to treat right now? Mm -hmm. Hands down always is pain. I manage the pain first. Once I've got pain under control, then I can work on mobility. So I have a systematic way that in my brain, I'm able to work through a case. So then I always have a plan. There's never a case that comes in that I don't have some type of a plan for because I already have that script in my head of what I'm going to be thinking about. That gives me confidence because now I already know that there is something I'm going to be able to do to help that animal and something I'm going to be able to tell the the client so that they understand what we're going to go forth with doing. Yeah, and you'll communicate, obviously, with the clients. So our very first goal is to manage the pain. This is what we're going to do. Once we've done that, then we're moving on to this. And that also must, for them, make them feel, you know, like they can trust you because you're looking out for the one thing that they're probably worried about. Is their animal in pain? You know, because that's a question that they ask because sometimes they don't know. They They think it isn't, but they're always querying, you know. You know, and if you think about it, how many times um, clients have come to you and say, like, are they suffering? Are they in pain? Because yep. that's the one thing that they're worrying about. So like, that's a really, really great first goal always um, yeah. to be able to, to tell them. And then they'll think like, okay, she's mm-hmm. onto this. Yeah. And, you know, on top of that stuff that I do is, you know, on social media or in my emails to my clients, I'm sending out ways for them to assess pain. So I'm saying, yeah. here's 
these are the things that you may be seeing in your pet. There's a lot, I mean, I get a question all the time. I don't know, how do I know if they're in pain? How do I know? I don't know. They may do this, they may do that. Is that pain? Is it not? Because they are, they're not us. They're not, and we, then we've also been taught, oh, are you gonna you know, put our human feelings on our animals? No, absolutely not. They can absolutely feel pain. They're gonna show it in different ways. And so being able to give them the education on top of that, to be able to acknowledge the pain that the animal may be experiencing. So providing your owners or your clients with tools to be able to manage things at home, you know, and, and to be able to assess things at home, I think is also another tool that we can use to be able to give the owners their own confidence as well, that we know what we're doing. We're going to give you confidence that you know what you're doing too. And I think that's also a nice uh, partnership that you can have with the owners. Yeah, I love it. You're empowering them and giving them the tools to be able to help their pet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this, you know, also comes into to play when we talk about the home exercise program, um, you know, and, and making it a partnership with them and empowering them that they put their efforts into what are what we're doing they put their efforts into the exercises and what we do what you do it's all going to work together and we're going to help your pet in the long run and so you know i think the very first step with that initial consult you can set up that team um, between you and the owner develop the the confidence that you know what you're doing and that you have the skills to do it you're going to establish that game plan to move forth so now we have kind of a structure because I do think that a lot of anxiety in people come from, comes from not having a structure. It comes from not having a plan. And yeah. if we can provide that structure for our owners, I think it helps them. And the ones that listen to what we say, of course, it's, it's going to help them to be able to know, okay, we're going to treat for two weeks doing this. We're going to reassess. We're going to reevaluate. I got it. I can make it to two weeks. Let me know if there's any problems along the way, but we're going to do this until two weeks. So it, it gives them boundaries. It gives them a plan. It gives them something that they can hold on to that's tangible um, that helps their anxiety about what their pet's going through. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think for all of us, it's dreadful to have this sort of open-endedness to things, you know? Um, so like, we always want to know when is something going to finish, you know? So when is it the end or whatever? And you might not be the exact end, but if you have a time frame, you say like certain number of weeks, then they can say in their mind, okay, like I'm going to commit to these next two weeks or next three weeks, whatever it is. Um, and then they'll be hundred percent committed. But if you're just like every single week, they're coming and they say, well, there is some improvement, but we're still not there yet. And you know, you're not actually giving them any time frame. Then they start to think oh, now, when is this ever going to end? Right, right. And I think that's where you go back to your basics too. And you look at what are the, the links of time of tissue healing, you know, versus, you know, a tendon, a ligament, a bone, a muscle, you know, and being able to share that. I think uh, Leilani Alvarez did a webinar with you guys on all of that. And I think that was really great. Have it written down so that you can, you know, say, well, our ligaments aren't going to be healed for, you know, we've got eight to 12 weeks before we're going to even have any acknowledgement of healing tissue here. Um, you know, and being able to share that with the clients, you know, I have some iliopsoas strains come in and by the time we get to week six, they're like, when can we let them run loose? And I'm like, well, we've got to get at least eight to 12 weeks before we're going to have any kind of healing happening. So please don't do that. We're going to start back at zero. So I think that's where you can give these time frames. You know, you're looking at this is going to be three months of rehab. This is going to be four months of rehab. Um, you know, I very often have post-op uh, neurologic cases that come in and they're like not able to walk right after surgery. And they're like, if we don't get them walking in the next week, we're going to be done. And I'm like, you know, actually we have, you know, three to six months of time to get that neurologic reconditioning back and it's going to be okay. And, you know, and, and so you give the owners that sense of security that since we're not in a rush and rehab doesn't happen overnight and don't set up false expectations with them, give them realistic timelines and that helps their anxieties. It helps them to, to, to say, okay, you got this. It's just going to be a little bit long drawn out but here's your estimate of money that you're going to need to spend as well, because that's 
also important that you're not like they're they're going to look at you after four weeks and they're going to be like how much more of my money do you want you're just in this for the money you have to preface it at the beginning this is going to be this long we're probably looking at approximately this cost we'll tell you along the way if things change or happen to change that treatment plan so just i think that's where you you know establishing your boundaries of treatment plan and time frames i think is incredibly important yeah i mean talking about money is sometimes really tricky for some therapists mm-hmm. um i think for a lot of us you know we often just you know we want to say oh you can just speak to a receptionist about that you know right. if somebody starts mentioning money right. how do you handle yeah. that Oh man, my heart still like gets tachycardic just thinking about talking about money. So I don't think it's ever easy. It's just the society we live in that we, you know, are nervous or stressed out about talking about money. So I always talk about everything else first. So I give a detailed um, description of diagnosis, treatment plan, all that's involved you know, it's, it's a lot of work to get all this done. Then I say, here's your estimate for the first four weeks. If you buy this as a package, you know, there'll be 10% off here, whatever. And um, we're going to email you that estimate. Now we're looking at approximately, and then I give them the number. I can't tell you how many times they're like, whoa, that's cheaper than I thought it was going to be. And I was like, what did you think it was going to be? And they're like $10,000. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's, that's a bit excessive. So I always like that better. I'm like, I'd rather come in low yeah. than high. Um, and then there's other people that are like, I absolutely cannot spend that money on my animal and I have to rework the plan. Not a big deal. It's fine. But I always just kind of, I bring it in at the end and I say after, you know, for a total of six weeks of therapy, this is your cost email them over the estimate, look through the estimate. If you'd like to go ahead and schedule, if it looks fine now, then that's fine. If you'd like to look it over and discuss, send me some emails on questions that you have. And if it doesn't work for you, we will develop a treatment plan that works within your budget. Just let me know what your budget is. And, you know, I've sent a treatment plan off before that was, you know, $1,200 before. And they said, you know, we can afford to do $600 for the first four weeks. So I said, okay. And I made the treatment plan what I thought was important to be. Um, and the owners ended up doing it, you know, so it's, it's important to kind of be complete before you pick up the phone. And and this is my biggest pet peeve ring, ring, ring. Hi. Yeah. You'd like to make a consult. All right. We need $140 right now with your credit card. Well, I haven't done anything yet. Oh, it's going to be, the whole thing's going to be $3,000. So if you don't do the $3,000 program, then you know, might as well not even make the appointment. That's the worst. You're bringing up money before you've sold the plan. Okay. I've sold the plan way before I even tell them what the cost is going to be. And in fact, Mm -hmm. I make the cost kind of a side note, if you will, because what's more important is that we're doing this to treat our, to, to fix our goals, to game for our goals. Um, So we've set the goals. We've established what the game plan is going to be, what it entails and how much work it entails. Cause we do talk about, you know, how many people it involves and we're going to do this. And then we talk about the money. So at that point, I've already sold them on the treatment plan. And a lot of times people will come up with the money without a problem. Yeah. Like they, yeah. they want to treat their pets the way, the best way that they can. Um, and with that approach, I've had very few people decline to come in and do the therapies. Yeah, I love that suggestion. So you give them like your your basically your your A plan. This is a, this is what I suggest. Um, and if they can't, then you try and change it up so that at least the animal's getting some rehab. So some rehab is better than no rehab at all. Um, but the, the owner's obviously always knowing because you've given them that first plan. That's actually the ideal. This is actually what I suggest. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can't afford it, you know you can help them in another way. Love yeah. It. And usually if they can't do something, you know, financially, then I say, I really, really, really need you to do your home exercise plan. I really need you to put this part in. And if you find it difficult to do that part, then I would say we need to reassess what we're doing in-house and in clinic. And, and sometimes people say, okay, I, I see that I can't do this at home. I think it is worth to do the money for you guys to do it here. So, it, and sometimes you put the ball in their court and you say, okay, well, you go ahead and perform these exercises. Oh, it's a lot harder than I thought. Um, you know, so I'll let you guys do it here. Um, and then they come in and we see results and the owners are very happy that they did it. So. 
Yeah, I like that. So you, you're basically saying to them, right, well, if you want to cut costs, you can do some of this. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And and then you get you need their commitment right there because that's often a uh, you know often a thing that's a problem to try and get them commit to the exercises. Yes. Um, so I think about when I was in practice, you know, I would sell them on what we were doing, and in my mind, they were always doing those therapeutic exercises. So I like right. it that you actually put it in right in the beginning. I'm doing all of them, um, yeah. and if they don't want that, then say okay. Well, then you yeah. can do them. Um, and the, and then, the home exercise program that we have right now, we can actually see when the clients opened up the program last. So okay. if somebody says, oh yeah, we're doing all of the exercises you prescribe uh-huh. and I'm not seeing the animal improve, then I open that up and I'm like, well, you haven't really opened your exercise program in two months. So I'm not really sure you're doing the exercises at home. So then I kind of say, okay, well, we need to make sure we're doing these exercises. Let me help you put that in your lifestyle. So if you're home 15 minutes in the morning with breakfast, we're going to do cookie stretches for breakfast, you know? And I kind of like, I try and empower them. Like you can do this. I try and speak positively. I never tell them they're doing wrong things or bad things. Somebody wants to feel bad about it, but I do try and encourage them. Um, you know, when they start failing at at the home exercises, cause it's hard. I'm not very good at it either. I bring my own dog to rehab to get rehab (laughs) exercises done. (laughs) I know it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm in exactly the same position. I've got a dog and you know, she was actually due acupuncture on Saturday. So it's like Wednesday today. And I'm like, my, my daughter yesterday said to me, you still haven't done acupuncture on sunshine. I mean, I don't know, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. So I'm exactly the same. I know it's um, all yep. these things that we should be doing, right? Um, so yeah, we give them a little bit of a break, the, the owners. So one of the things that I think about, you know, from my patients um, and my clients when I was doing my consulting was that very first consult, there's so much information that you have to share with them. And they often clients would get this volume overload. Yes. And, and especially when we're trying to educate them about the condition that their pet has and what we need to do. Um, how do you handle that? Because, you know, often you, they'll be looking at you as if they're understanding. And mm-hmm. then either what happens is there's a phone call from a partner or husband or wife at yep. phones and says, um, he didn't or she didn't remember or understand anything you said, <laughs> or there's an email that follows up. I didn't quite get that. I could, it was a little bit much or the next consult. Yep. They'll say, can you just go over that again? Cause it was just too much for me. So yeah. Any tips on, on handling that kind of thing? Yeah. So I do things a little different probably in my practice than a lot of people, but I have a scribe in the room with me who is, in a sense, kind of writing down what we've discussed with the owner, whether it be a a certain diagnosis or tips, hints, things like that. Um, And then I have a lot of handouts that can go home in addition to that. Um, I'm more than happy to always go back through things because I try and go over the, this is the diagnosis. This is our game plan. These are our goals. And it's being written up the whole time. I send a copy to the owner. I let them peruse through it. If there are questions that follow up after that, then we have more conversation either via email or phone chat. Um, I like email a lot. It's so much easier for me. Um, I know they're not going to come out knowing everything I said. I also try and go slowly through the process. I always leave in the initial visit and I've kind of remodeled this with COVID, but I leave in the initial visit 30 minutes of chat time with the owner. So either during that time, the animals got a treatment going, whether it be acupuncture, laser, whatever needed to be. And then I'm also chatting with the owner about everything going on. So I start off with the, the what's going on, the disease process. I pause and I say, do you have any questions at this point? And so I'm going very slowly and trying not to overload them with too much information. I try and make sure that I'm covering any questions that I would have because I'm probably worst patient in regards to just asking questions, asking questions, asking, I want to know everything. So I want to answer all of my questions that I would have. 
So I talk about the options. I talk about surgical op options. I talk about conservative management. I talk about the drugs in detail about what we're going to be using. Um, I, I discuss the therapeutic plan, why we're using the home exercises. And I go over it really slowly, but I stop and ask questions or let them ask questions along the way. Meanwhile, of course, my scribe is taking notes so that we're highlighting those things. Um, at the end of the, the question answer time, usually clients say, you've been very thorough. I don't have any questions right now, but I probably will later. Um, is there, can you put down in writing for me, blah, blah, blah. And maybe I will be able to jot something really quickly down that's got more detail than maybe my scribe had. So I think because that's such an important consult, I take the time to make sure everything is uh, discreetly explained. There's so many resources, you know, when it comes to like osteoarthritis with Kristen Kirkby Shaw's website, you can use, she's got handouts for all different types of diseases of osteoarthritis. Um, you can go online if there's other things that you might like online that discuss surgical complications or whatever you're sending them for. Give them tools, give them as many tools as you can. I've got, you know, Adequan brochures, I've got um, shockwave brochures, I've got laser brochures, you know, I want them to have those things in writing so that they can look through, ask questions later, because usually that's when the questions come. And then I tell them, I say, please email me if there are questions that come up after this. And then I go into, you know, the next day, maybe an email. I also, if they're very inquisitive, when I send my referring letter to the vet out, which does lay out all my diagnoses, my problems list, my goals, all that stuff, I'll just CC the owner on that email. So they get it in the, the scientific medical language too. So they can kind of look through that jargon. They can see, I mean, it's probably usually three or four pages long, how detailed my exam was, everything we went through. And, and pretty much that covers all their questions if I've handled all of those things. But that is a big, huge emphasis for me um, during the initial consult is the communication with the client and making sure they thoroughly understand everything that we're talking about. Yeah, I love the fact that you CC those clients in, but you're not CCing all your clients in, right? No, no. Okay. I don't think they all need it. In some cases, some of the clients, um, they come back with, oh, I didn't actually say that in the history. You know, it's like, it's, that's not a big deal. You know, what I wanted you to take from this was the, the summary, the details. So it, those types of owners, I'll only send them a summary. So you kind of get to know your client too. You have to hear their concerns. You have to hear what type of client they are. Um, you know, your sports clients are going to be way different than your leisure pet dog clients are going to be. So you have to know who you're talking to. You have to know what detailed information they want. Um, and that's that little bit I talk about in one of our business basics about emotional intelligence. That's that little bit of you reading into what the client, who your client is and how your client needs you to interact with them. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the part, that's the, the part you can learn better and you can get better at doing it. But it's, uh, but talking to clients and knowing what kind of, what needs they have is, is something you learn over time, I think. So obviously one of our important things for us is to get referrals from other veterinary practices. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you use with a client to strengthen those relationships with your vets? Yeah. So I always make sure that I am number one, very discreet in that I do not do any general medicine. So if they come to me and say, my dog's throwing up, my dog has an ear infection, my dog has diarrhea, I say, you need to please call your veterinarian. The other thing that I do is if during my exam, I notice that the pet has not been in for blood work in a year, the pet has not been in for their ears to be checked or for their teeth to be checked, I'm going to make note of those in my physical exam. And I'm going to direct them to their referring vet. So now don't want to make it a monetary thing, but now I've sent that and I've sent them some, you know, a visit, whereas maybe the owner didn't notice that their dog had an ear infection. Maybe they didn't notice that they had skin disease starting. Um, maybe they didn't notice a mass somewhere that we've found. And I send that all back to them. 
even to the point where I send x-rays back to them. The only thing I do in my clinic is emergency x-rays. If I have to, I have a neighboring clinic I go to and I do musculoskeletal ultrasound because most people don't know how to do that. So those are the things I'm going to keep in house. Everything else, like if I need them to run, um, you know, a blood test for a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory panel, I'm sending that back to the referring vet. I also get on the phone with them. You know, I had a client who said, wow, my dog's not walking right now because their dermatitis is so bad on their foot. Great. I think you need to probably grab a spray from your vet. Uh, let me contact your vet. I emailed the vet. They were like, we absolutely agree with you. Here's the spray for your client. So I'm, I'm setting up this communication between owner, myself, and the referring vets. I am very accessible. It is one of my goals to always be very accessible to my clients. I'm more accessible than any other veterinarian probably is. That allows them to ask me these types of questions that may not be within my scope, but I immediately send it back to the referring vet. I'm not, I don't want to do gen med anymore. I honestly, I'm done with that, but I want to be that. I want to be the gap. I want to be the bridge, um, the bridge, not a gap. I want to be the bridge and the gap to, to speak with the, the vets and the vets respect that they respect what I'm seeing and, and they like it a lot. So um, that's what I do. I just I have a really open communication with everybody. Yeah. And it seems like it's very clear to the vet, to the pet owner, exactly where you stand um, and where they stand. Yeah. And it has to be. And when I started this, I was working, I did gen vet and I did rehab and it was so muddy and it was just, it drove me crazy because I'm like, I can't do that. And they're like, but you can, because you see me on, you know, Wednesdays. And I'm like, no, I can't though. You know? So it's, it's really, it's nice to be in a standalone rehab facility where I can draw the line and then say, go back to your vet. Um, and then they feel comfortable with referring to me because I'm not going to cross the line. They know I'm not. Um, and so that it really creates a very nice, strong relationship with them. Yeah. So another thing that is something that is a, a way in which we often get clients is through clients talking to their friends um, and to their colleagues and family. Is there anything that you do to encourage your clients to talk about you and to share their experiences with your, with your practice? Yeah, it, I would tell you that is the biggest source of referrals. Um, so we always keep track of that. And, and the number one is word of mouth. Um, I think the very first thing I do is just, I provide that red carpet service for all of my clients. If you do that, if your staff is, is that way, you're going to make such a big impression that people are going to want to talk about you. Um, and that's pretty much what's happened for me is that we just, we treat everybody amazingly. I do offer a referral credit. Nobody really, I don't know that they even know that they, they're getting it until after they get it, that, you know, it's as a thank you. It's just, hey, thanks so much for chatting about us. And um, most people don't even care about it. You know, honestly, they just are like, my dog's doing great. You guys are awesome. You guys care about my animals. Uh, and that's all we really care about. So we're going to talk about you to everybody if we can. You know, I've got this one set of clients, I love them. Um, they walk their dogs at a dog park every single day. And pretty much like I should just hand them a stack of business cards. Although they just sit there and chat about us all, to everybody that walks by them. It's, it's great. It's like the best marketing ever. Um, and so I had this client come in once and they were like, yeah, we learned about you at the dog park. And I was like, oh, do you know who? And they're like, we have no idea who they were, but they told us to come get you, come see you. And I was like, all right, cool. Um, I knew exactly who it was. But um, so, it, you know, those are the types of clients that you want to, to keep around that you and if you provide this amazing service, then everybody's going to talk. Like you don't have to do anything special for them except for provide amazing service. And um, my staff knows that that's the level of quality we want to have. Um, we, from the minute you, you pick up the phone and talk to my receptionist till the minute you walk out, you're going to feel like we care and that we're trying our hardest to do what we can for your pet. Um, and that's hands down the best way to get referrals. So. Yeah. So what I always tell the vet we have is, is you want to make your clients feel like every day is their birthday. So if you think yeah. about how great you feel on your birthday, when they come to your practice, they should be feeling like it's their birthday. Yeah. Feeling so special. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I love that. <laughs> awesome. Lisa, thank you so much um, for the chat. And yeah, I'm just amazed all the time at everything that you have to share and everything that you're doing. So congratulations on your, your practice and thank you for always sharing and offering advice to the vet rehabbers.
Absolutely. Thanks, Megan. Bye, guys. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. For more information about continuing education for vet rehab therapists, you can go to onlinepethealth.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast and of course, thank our sponsors, Response System. They are as passionate about therapy lasers and PEMF equipment as you are about veterinary rehabilitation. They would love to answer any questions you have, so please please feel free to reach out to them at responsesystems.com or you can email lisa at responsesystems.com.